Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. The sun is setting and I'm looking forward to tonight. A preparation is in order for I set apart to you life. It's our delight. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. May this day be yours and mine, I bow down at your throne. Well, welcome everybody to the, the second meeting that we've had since we've been recording these. And uh, we want to touch on some things that you all might have trouble with too. So anybody that has a, a question, by all means, at any time, you can just shoot your hand up and that's what this is about. It's not about just me standing here leading you. But I did. I have a few things that Yahuwah has given me to mention today, and I just wanted to bring those up, and, and we can still carry on with whatever issues that you all might have, too. Um, I wanted to start the meeting off with the thing that he told us to talk about, um, to speak of, and teach to our children when we rise up and when we lie down and when we come in and when we go out and we walk along the way. Um, and that would be his covenant. And we'll just begin by reading it right here. Uh, Moshe reiterated this at Deuteron Deuteronomy 5. And he said, I stood between Yahuwah and you at that time to declare to you the word of Yahuwah. That's the word that he keeps referring to. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain. And here's what he said. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, I've got to scroll this down a little bit here, and. but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Focus on that word, love me and guard my commands. See, love is obedience. That's what he's referring to. He's trying to get your attention so that he'll make you aware that love is actually obeying him. That's how he sees it. Uh, it says, you do not bring the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to naught, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who brings his name to naught. The fourth commandment is, or declaration or instruction, is guard the Sabbath day to set it apart. Now, Yahuwah actually blessed the seventh day at, uh, in Genesis or Bereshith. And what he blesses doesn't get unblessed later on. So if he blessed the day, uh, who could ever remove that blessing? Uh, it says, uh, guard, the, uh, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as you who and your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and you do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of you who and your Elohim. It's his Sabbath. You do not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. He used the manna to instruct them because they lost it. The uh, fifth commandment is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you so that your days are prolonged 
and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim was giving you. And uh, the sixth commandment would be, you do not murder. The seventh is you do not commit adultery. The eighth is you do not steal. And the ninth is you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth is you do not cover your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his doggy, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Um, or his computer. <laughs> this computer has been giving us trouble today. Um, anything that belongs to your neighbor. So these are the words. This is the covenant that he made with Israel. And any who join with Israel partake of this covenant. You know? Uh, <clears throat> Now, the, the next issue of business, uh, does anybody have any questions, first of all, about any of this and how it applies to people today? Or is it something in the uh, covenant here some, somehow changed in anyone's understanding? So, because see, the false, the anointed ones that are mentioned in Matthew, Matthew or Matthew chapter 24, the false anointed ones, false Christs, uh, may have misprogrammed people with an understanding that's different than this covenant. If it's different from this covenant, then, and there's no other change uh, indicated by any prophets, then uh, the false anointed ones have uh, have gone out into the world and tried to change that covenant, you know, in order to deceive you. And the funny thing about that is, people go there in mass to contribute to these people who are standing there in front of them with fancy clothes and, and, and beautiful surroundings similar to this and even better and they pay them to tell them lies you know if, the, if it doesn't go according to the word of Yahuwah then somebody has uh, deceived someone see deception is out there <clears throat> now here's a question does Yahuwah exist is he there at all if he's not we're just like a dead dog but if he is there then we may want to pay attention to what he said. Um, he says he does not change. And uh, although people that, that have gone out into the civilizations around the world, like Carl Sagan, have been trying to tell people that he doesn't exist, that we're you know, the result of rain on rock and molecules that came together and a long time passed, and then suddenly an eyeball appeared. Uh, <laughs> there's no fully functional eyeballs appearing anywhere in the record of the the geological uh, pattern, the geological column. Uh, there's not any, uh, they're all abrupt appearing life forms. You know, they didn't just, if, if nature, whatever that is, was experimenting to make an eyeball, where are those failed experiments at? You know, all those half sighted animals. And there would have to be many more of them than the sighted ones, the ones that actually have eyeballs. If you understand what I'm saying. If in fact, five billion years have passed and it was in the most recent percentage of that five billion years that life appeared on earth then all the experimentation that would be going on in the evolutionist mind would have to have produced a lot of accidents that didn't work where are those and there's not any you know it's not just a matter of finding one thing turning into another it's where are the accidents at where's the development you know Everything seems to work and function perfectly. Anyway, uh, if he exists, then we might want to pay attention to what he said through his prophets. I'm sure that most of all of you all here and watching are not arguing the fact that he exists. So we're going to assume that you are on board with that much. Now, according to Hebrews 11, there's a whole lot of, uh, in Hebrews 11, it deals with faith. Faith in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew term is emuna which is trust and faithfulness and fidelity. And uh, it's, it's the idea of trusting, you know. It, it isn't just a blind faith necessarily, but it's, uh, it's remaining steadfast, you know. Uh, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to Elohim must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So he rewards those that really look for him because he will allow himself to be found. 
by those that diligently seek him. Uh, people like Carl Sagan, I don't want to pick on him uh, alone, but uh, people that are of his ilk are actually not seeking him. They're seeking some other thing, anything but that, you know, because otherwise they might have to actually obey. Um, now the next question is, is there a Sabbath? Is there even a Sabbath at all? Well, Yahuwah seems to indicate that there is throughout Scripture. Uh, it, it starts in the first book of the Scriptures, you know, what they call Genesis or Bereshith. We've got, you know, uh, the days of the week are mentioned in creation, and then the seventh day is a remembrance forever of this creation week. And then we have all through the Scriptures, a Sabbath is mentioned. And when you go through the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, some 40, 41 years after the ascension, you have the Sabbath is mentioned all over the place. And uh, it's a lot of times you'll notice that Gentiles are packed in to these synagogues to study on the Sabbath. That's where they were studying. See, Israelites didn't typically go to a synagogue. He didn't command any synagogues to be built. Yahuwah never commanded a synagogue to be built. Therefore, he didn't command anybody to go to a synagogue on the Sabbath day. That's not a commandment. This is just something that is not true. But it's not expected. But if you are a Gentile and you don't know what the covenant is, because then you have to go somewhere. So the rabbis, the teachers, would teach them in the synagogues on the Sabbath. Uh, the average Israelite was taught as a young child growing up in the home. That's where the parents taught the Torah to their children. Because see, if you read Deuteronomy 6, it says, these commandments which I gave you in Deuteronomy 5, uh, you are to teach diligently to your children and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And when you rise up and when you lie down, you're to teach these things to your children. Um, but the average person that was coming to Yahuwah from the outside, foreigners, ethnos, uh, they had to learn some way, so these little houses of study were built called synagogues, and the rabbis would come there on the Sabbath to teach these new proselytes the Torah. The Torah scroll would be sitting on some kind of a table, and they would stand up in front of them and read it to them. They didn't have their own copies, so and they didn't have the internet. <laughs> but anyway, the the thing that we have to understand is uh, that obviously there was a Sabbath even in what they call New Testament days. And Yahushua never had a problem with whether or not there was a Sabbath or not, or that there was, that was the correct day. He never disputed that. Uh, so if there is a Sabbath, let's investigate if there is first in a couple of spots using the uh, Messianic writings. Acts 15, 19 through 21 discusses this a little bit. Uh, I think it was Yaakov, Yahushua's brother, that said, therefore, it's my judgment, uh, my, my judgment is, that we not trouble them, those are the Gentiles, which were, uh, from, from, uh, which from among the Gentiles are turning to Yahuwah, or to Elohim, but that we write to them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moshe of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. Now, Yaakov was Yahushua's half-brother. And he could have said, well, we don't really have a Sabbath now, or it's Sunday, or whatever. But it isn't. It hasn't changed. It's still there. And um, nothing has changed at all. And Moshe is referring to the Torah, which was read in the synagogues for the Gentiles. See? That's what that's talking about. Now let me see if I can scroll this down just a tad. Get this up a little bit. Um, in Matthew 24, Yahushua is uh, in the temple complex and he's uh, being asked by his disciples to, uh, to look at these huge massive stones and how incredibly permanent everything looks, like it will never ever wear away. And of course, uh, he said there's going to be some bad things that are going to happen. And of course, every stone is going to be turned uh, turned down, every, every, every stone is going to be thrown down. And 
uh, they were actually literally thrown down in order to get the gold that was melting, to, that was seeping into the cracks. The Romans literally tore the stones apart to get to the little fragments of gold that had seeped into the cracks in, in the temple because there was quite a bit of gold that was melting in the fire because they burned a lot of women and children that were in the temple, you know. Um, anyway, these horrible times were going to come. He says, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Yehushua was sitting on the Mount of Olives, this is the same period, the same day probably, the students or disciples came to him privately and says, tell us. They said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Um, now, he, he, I've got the uh, translation here from probably the King James or something, and I've got the wrong words in here uh, for the translators, but uh, oh, that'll pop up occasionally. You'll see that. I've tried to alter some of them. But if you uh, understand what he's saying, he's talking about the extreme end days. So this isn't like um, just 70 AD or 70 CE. Uh, he talks about that when he, when he talks about the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. But then later on, he talks in the same text about the extreme end days. And he talks about the great tribulation. And mm -hmm. that the message or the besorah of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. So when you see standing in the set-apart place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand that let those who are in Yehuda flee to the mountains and let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of, his, out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak and how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. And then he says something very odd for the person that thinks that the Sabbath doesn't exist. You see, that's the question we're asking, does the Sabbath exist? Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So the elect are still going through this terrible thing that people think they're going to be raptured away from. But in fact, they're going to be enduring to the end. The days will be shortened because the elect are still there. So, you know, and there's other things down here to consider. But this is the extreme end days when he's referring to the Sabbath. And if we think, well, he's talking about messianic believers that were raised as Israelites and we're Christians and we're Gentiles. Well, you can't have two bodies. There's only one body. And if an Israelite is keeping the covenant and he accepts his Messiah, he doesn't have to change his religion. Why would that be? Why would a, an Israelite, think about this, if you were of the tribe of Manasseh or Reuben or Yehuda or any of those, or a Luwite, uh, and somebody said, let me tell you about the Messiah. Are you going to tell me that they're going to have to become a Christian and follow Sunday and E-A-S-T-E-R and Christmas and all those things? And their religion would change because they accepted their Messiah? It's their Messiah. Israel is the only one that has a Messiah at all. And it would be silly. But you see, replacement theology has got people's minds programmed by sound bites and you know, little cultural things that they just sort of assume are true, but they're not true. Anyway, let's uh, move down to the next uh, item. This is another reference to the Sabbath. We're just bouncing around in a couple of spots. Uh, Yeshiyahu, or Isaiah 66, says, as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares Yahuwah, so will your name and descendants endure. <coughs> from one new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, man, all mankind will come down and bow down before me. Now, he's not saying on the new moons. He's saying from new moon to new moon. So these people are bowing down to him permanently. This is like a, a big net that he's capturing all time with. From week to week, Sabbath to Sabbath. That's a one Sabbath day to the next Sabbath day. And everything in between them 
they're bowing down to him. It's not just on those days, see? So it says that there, uh, there's a Sabbath coming in uh, the new heavens and the new earth. Is there one now? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Well, you bet there is. Replacement theology has just uh, distorted it. Now, this is interesting, too. In Yeshayahu, the same prophet, Isaiah 56, it says, For this is what Yahuwah says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and within its walls a memorial name and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to Yahuwah, now how do you do that? Well, you enter his covenant. If you become in a covenant relationship with him, that was the covenant that we started out reading, then you are binding yourself to Yahuwah to serve him, to love the name of Yahuwah, and to worship him, that means obey him. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, um, that would mean defiling it, and hold fast to my covenant. And it says, and this is where the Christians sing songs and they quote from it, but they do it in sound bites. They leave out that and they just show you this. These I will bring to my set-apart mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. See, the word Abraham is probably most likely Abraham because it's a plural. It means father of nations, Abba, Abrahim, a father of nations. That's the nations he's talking about. But you have to be in the covenant in order to be brought to this set of our now, you know. And that doesn't mean that you can, like, keep nine of the commandments and say, yeah, I'm in a covenant relationship with him. I just have a problem with that one. <laughs> See, that doesn't add up. Matthew 7, Yahushua himself said that there were going to be all these people coming and saying, we were taught this way and we did these things for you. We did all these wonderful things incredible things. And we served you from morning till night, day after day, week after week, year in, year out. We gave you all these presents. We celebrated your birthday <laughs> and your resurrection. We did all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, the one that doesn't have his covenant, the Torah. For I knew you not. If you love me, you shall guard my command. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Go therefore, go you therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them or immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Ruach HaKadosh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What would that be that he had commanded them? He's talking to Israelites. He's not talking to Presbyterians or Lutherans. He's talking to Israelites. They're special Israelites too because they're called the Nazarene. If you read Acts 24 verse 5, they're called, uh, uh, Shaul or Paul was accused of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene, not the sect of the Christians. That's a Greek word. Why would Yahushua's people be called by a Greek term? This is uh, just translation, you know. But uh, why not restore it? Because Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah, it, I think it's verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, says that he was going to restore a pure lip, a pure language to his people in the end times. And they would all worship him shoulder to shoulder. You know, they would be in, you know, on the same page together. You know, they wouldn't be one keeping Sabbath on one day and another keeping Sabbath a different day. Uh, that he would, we would serve him shoulder to shoulder. We would just agree with what he wrote. And it says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He's referring to the end of the times of the Gentiles, no doubt, too. Is there a Sabbath distance that we can travel on the Sabbath? Well, that's a, that's a question that personally you've got to ask yourself. You've got to really do a personal study on this, but there's a lot of differences among Messianic teachers. They want you to come to their assembly every Sabbath. 
But you have to, first of all, ask yourself, where is that written exactly? If you come to an assembly on the Sabbath, then what would you be there for? Well, you'd probably be a, most likely a Gentile. In other words, you wouldn't be in the covenant yet, but you'd be studying the covenant. And you'd be, you know, going to the synagogue or a house of study someplace. Now, let's see if there is a Sabbath distance. Acts 1.12 so uh, they were watching him going up into the air uh, and leaving them finally after he'd been with them about 40 days. Yahushua had just left. And then they returned to Yerushalayim from the mount called Olivet, which is near Yerushalayim. You all know where the Mount of Olives is. A Sabbath day is journey away. Now you might want to look at like four or five translations on this. And look at the scriptures and see how they phrase that. But every one of them actually uses that word Sabbath. And it talks about Sabbath's distance, Sabbath's journey, the ability for you to actually move from one place to another at it as an extreme point, you know. Um, and that's interesting. Because if we if we think, well, what is a Sabbath's distance? Is there actually a measurement? Where's the Torah? Well, I haven't actually found a Torah other than Exodus or Shemoth chapter 16. Um, I, I think I've mentioned, I'll mention that right down here. Um, yeah, it's the next thing. Exodus uh, 16, 28 through 30 says, Then Yahuwah said to Moshe, How long will you refuse to keep my commands? It's the word mitzvah. And my instructions, Torothi, that's meaning the singular would be Torah, or Torah, tor, uh, Torah, Torah. Uh, that would be the plural instructions, Torothi. Bear in mind that Yahuwah has given you the Sabbath. Are you paying attention to the Sabbath? Well, let, let's talk about that. That's what he's talking about. That is why the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. Okay, well, there's one little interesting thing. So the people rested on the seventh day. What is it that they had to do? Well, they rested. See? I rested yesterday. That was uh, This is uh, the first day of the week. And I feel refreshed. I'm ready for another six days of work. I'm back to work today. This is what the Gentiles have traditionally called the day of the sun, Sunday. This is when they went to their steeples, you know. Yes? Why did it change? You know, why did they change the Sabbath from, you know, the seventh day to the first day? How does that happen? Well, actually, the only historical record that points to that is Constantine, in the year 321, set up what he called one of the Blue Laws, which carried the penalty of death. Uh, it was a governmental, empire-wide edict, and it was called the Constant an Edict of Constantine. And it was in the year 321. And he forbade artisans and merchants from conducting any business on the day of the sun, the venerable day of the sun. And that was what they called Sunday. They were already worshiping the sun. And so in order to hybridize and uh, bring all these different diverse beliefs together in his empire, he just said, well, we're going to make this a day of, of rest. You know, And uh, the adversary knows what he's doing. He uh, uses these things to the government sometimes to do make things happen that way. Anybody that worked on that day was put to death. And uh, except for the farmers, they were exempted in the planting times to go ahead and do it because of the urgency of the need to plant their, their crops. But they were the only exception that was mentioned in this edict. Everyone else had to take the day off. And uh, that's where it really started. Uh, continuing on, if we... Um, if we understand what no one is to go out means, and those you can look at different translations, everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. Now, imagine Israel in the wilderness. They're in a, uh, an area that is probably, I'm just going to guess, uh, something like a half of a mile to three quarters of a mile across. That's all of Israel. We're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, 
maybe a half a million in that ballpark, maybe even a little more, and possibly even as many as a million, because we don't really know how many children there were, how many women there were. They don't really give us those numbers. But if we look at about a million people, or probably a million people, or give or take, uh, in a say a half a mile to three quarters of a mile square, because see the the tribes, the, the Levitical priesthood was in the middle, right in the middle, squarely in the middle of the camp. And the camp is, uh, you know, the size of this camp you can only imagine. Uh, but they're in the, in the middle of it. And the Shekinah, or the pillar of fire, is shooting straight up from that point. And everybody can see it in the daytime, and everybody can see it in the nighttime. It's right there, and it's huge. It probably has no top. It just keeps on going up in, into infinite outer space, for all we know. And um, everybody could see it. It was like this giant pillar yeah. of light. And uh, on the north side, of course, there were three tribes. And on the uh, east side, there were three tribes. And on the south side, there were three, three tribes by their clans and families. And on the west side, uh, I know that Yehuda, I think, was on the, uh, on the east side. And uh, I think uh, Ephraim and his, fe his fellow tribesmen were over on the west side. Anyway, and, uh, you know, the north and the south. You can look at that uh, in Ezekiel and find out where that is. In Leviticus, uh, Numbers. Yeah. yeah, that's where it is. And uh, anyway, where they were, this is an enormous space. Okay, now, if the Sabbath comes, is everybody going to get up and go someplace? You know, I mean, these are already pretty densely packed in people. They don't have to do anything on the Sabbath but one thing, and that's rest. They don't have to go to a synagogue. There are no synagogues. They're living in tents. He didn't say to anybody, you're supposed to go study my Torah. No. They talked about the Torah all the time. When did they do that? Well, when they rose up, when they lied down, when they went in, when they went out. It was all over the place, you see. And they taught it to their children, see. The children grew up learning this, see. Now, the foreigners, they had to learn it. That, those are the people we're really talking about in the New Covenant writings when we talk about the synagogue. It was packed with Gentiles. It's not like the synagogues are today. They're not, they're not teaching the Gentiles. You know? Well, you know, we're, we're programmed by the culture around us, and we just get these wrong ideas. Yes? Okay, so, like today, if there are people out here that are coming out, you know, the churches, and they want to learn the Torah, so we're talking about people can congregate together. Oh, yeah, know, every day. To learn the Torah. Sure. So it's not, I mean, they can travel to, to meet and, and study the Torah to learn it together. Is that, uh, well, is that true? Well, now that's, uh, that's where we're going to have differences yeah. of opinion because see, the, the teachers today, the assistant rabbis, as I call them, they're not, they call themselves rabbis, the messianic rabbis. Mm -hmm. They're really assistant rabbis because we only have one rabbi. All you can do is assist him. A pastor, you're not a pastor. A shepherd, if you're only one shepherd, there's only one shepherd. We're assistant shepherds and assistant pastors, you know. But when we want people to come to a meeting and we see, if it's on the Sabbath, and we see them selling books on the Sabbath, and we see them selling videos, and we see them taking money, then that's probably why they're really there. And they want them to come from far and wide. What? That might be it. I've got an issue with traveling to meet on the Sabbath. Well, we're going to look at those examples in Scripture. Okay. Well, my my big problem with it is, what if you're, you know, you've got your car gassed up, everything's ready to go, but you're halfway there and you get a flat. Well, you fix that flat yourself and you call a tire service. Yeah. And then if you call the tire service, okay, hey, you're not working, but you're causing someone else to have to work. And yeah. well, if we just stayed at home, slept, study a little scripture, whatever, you know, just rest, then we're not going to have any conflict. I'm not saying anybody is out of bounds. It's a matter of your heart. If you're saying that it's okay for you to travel on the Sabbath because you think there's another commandment that sort of supersedes it, and I'll show you that too. But I'm going to show you all these examples, and you all can make up your own minds. But uh, anyway, it, it, it's a matter of is there a Sabbath, first of all? Is there a Sabbath distance? Well, there seems to be a Sabbath distance, but I'm just referring back to the camp of Israel. Did they get together? I don't know. Now, there were there are Messianic teachers out there that say, well, a Sabbath distance to me is uh, 
as far as my tank of gas will, will take me, because I will not buy and sell, I don't go to restaurants, I don't buy gasoline, and I hope I don't have a flat tire, but that tank of gas is my Sabbath distance. Now, if he was standing next to these fellows that were returning to Jerusalem a Sabbath distance away, and he said, you know, fellas, you guys don't even have this thing, because I came here in a time machine, and I've got this, this Jeep, and it's all gassed up, and I'm going to be able to just... Uh, you know, I'm going to be able to go to northern Israel today. They think he was cra he was crazy. They say, well, you know, it isn't a matter of whether or not you've got the transportation to go someplace. He doesn't care about that. He says you are not to leave your vicinity. You're not to go out of your place on the Sabbath. Why would it be different for us than it is for Israel? Well, we are Israel. I don't know. What about the guy that's got a, a jetpack? Or what if he's got a rocket ship? Or a, or a flying saucer. If he's got a flying saucer, then his Sabbath distance might be, you know, the next star. 4.3 light years away, Alpha Centauri. Is that really what we're supposed to think? A Sabbath distance? Is there, is there a Sabbath distance? Well, it says there is a Sabbath distance. What is it? It's a thousand cubits. If you measure the camp of Israel, and you look at the distance that you can go. Now that's three quarters of a mile, or three fifths of a mile, or something like that. Three fifths of a mile, I believe it is. Now, if you get out there and start walking on the Sabbath for, and you go on a straight line, three quarters of a mile or three fifths of a mile, you're going to be really far away. But that's the outer boundary. And then if you stick your foot out and you go, haha, I just exceeded it. He's not looking at that, but. I'm not trying to be, you know, watching every inch, but he's just wanting you to rest. Now, if you go back after having walked a thousand cubits or three fifths of a mile, then you're going to be a pretty tuckered out little, little person. You know, I'm going to be feeling it, you know, myself. But he doesn't want you to get out there and do that necessarily, but you can if you want. But the reason that he gave the manna what, for 40 years was to show people that there wasn't going to be any reason for them to leave the camp. See, the man that wasn't coming down around them on the camp, it was coming outside the camp. They had to go out and work hard to get that. It took them many, many, many hours of gathering manna. They were like little flakes. And each one of them, you know, received, you know, a, a handful, you know, or maybe a couple of handfuls of them. And it was probably pretty, uh, pretty dense, but it was enough to keep them alive for two days uh, on, the, on the sixth day. Well, anyway, I mean, we can, we can argue about it, but some of us are going to be one way, and some of us are going to be another. And if you feel that your, your flying saucer will take you to, to Alpha, Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years away, because you've got it, and you don't have to buy any fuel for it, then that's your thing. But if your uh, gas tank is your limit, in your, in your vehicle because you won't buy and sell gas on the Sabbath, then uh, that's your thing. But but still, what if there's a leak in the dilithium chamber? Well, there you then go. Then he's got to get the engineer out, he's got to go down and repair it. And then the Klingons attack. Yeah. <laughs> See? Problems all around. If you just so, stayed home, you don't need to alleviate all that. But if your, heart, if your heart says it's okay to go and do that, and that happens, his mercy is there. Well, that's <laughs> true. Heart, and I want to show you. I want to show you a little bit here uh, how he, how people tend to uh, use these things to make their heart go this way. They lean this way. Um, they think that they're commanded to assemble every Sabbath. You know. Uh, Now, here's a test that he has in the same chapter of Exodus or Shemoth 16 and verse 4. Then Yahuwah said to Moshe, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions, my Torothi. Uh, he's going to test them to see if they're going to obey him. Sabbath is a test. And he's doing this with manna. It has to do with going out of your place. That's what he's talking about. Well, are these people going to stay in their place? Or are they going to jump up and say, where's my flying saucer? 
I've got a full low, uh, tank of dilithium crystals here, and it's going to take me as, as far as I want to go. Hebrews 10 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are set apart. There, there, whereof the Ruach HaKadosh also is a witness to us. To after that, and for after that he said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yahuwah. He's talking about the covenant here. <clears throat> I will put my Torah into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now, let's say that you just believe and you don't obey the Torah. Like a lot of Christians have said, well, the law is done away with, and we just have to believe and trust in Yahushua and his atonement for our sins. But we can just keep on ignoring those, sin, those things that describe sin. That's a very high risk. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brothers or brethren, boldness to enter into the set apart and into the holiest by the blood of Yahushua, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of Elohim. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's what we're doing here. We're, we're basically considering one another to provoke each other to love, to love Yahuwah and to love one another. That's what the covenant does. It, it teaches us how to love him and how to love one another. And we're just provoking each other to do good works. So if somebody is doing something differently and walking differently, we'd like to understand how that would be possible. Now, if a person wants to go ahead and stay in his place, it would be hard to understand why a person that has the flying saucer would criticize that person and say, what are you doing? We've got to assemble on every single Sabbath. You know this righteousness, don't you? Well, don't criticize us if we're resting. If I sleep the whole day, if I'm in a coma, I've kept the commandment. <laughs> what is it with this guy? He goes in and can do a coma every week. Well, that's okay. Here's where it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Where does the Torah tell us to assemble? I'm going to go to that. We're going to look at that. As a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking of, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Well, here's the verse that a lot of people say, well, you know what? It says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The writer of Hebrews is probably Shaul, because it speaks of him being in chains. So uh, it might be him, and he's saying he wants you to assemble together, as the commandment says. Well, let's look at the places where we're supposed to assemble, and then we'll know. Exodus 23, 14 through 17 says, three times a year, you are to celebrate a festival to me. This is for males that are 20 years and older. Now, women can come too. Little children can come too. But you see, the males are required to assemble three times a year. I mean, I've searched the scriptures very thoroughly, and I've tried to find any other commandments. This is it. Celebrate three times. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Matzah which is in the spring, for seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Abib. That's the word for grain. For in that month you came out of Mitzrayim, or Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. We're supposed to have a feast. You know, it's a happy thing. And uh, that's one. That's when we are to assemble. Celebrate the second one. The Feast of the Harvest and of First Fruits, which is called Shabuot, or Weeks, which is uh, 50 days from the day after the uh, seven. Well, it's actually, uh, pay close attention to this one. This is really a tricky one, because if you celebrate the Feast of Shavuot 
This is 50 days after the Sabbath that occurs during the week of Matzah, which happened up here. We have a, a, a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, that's in the midst of the week of unleavened bread. And you count 50 days from the morrow or the day after that Sabbath to the seventh week. And the morrow after the seventh Sabbath is Shavuot. This is 50th day after the Sabbath, uh, the weekly Sabbath that was during the week of Matzah. Now, Shavuot, which means literally weeks, because Shavuot means week, and it means the seven-day week, not just a seven-day period that you pick out, like uh, the fourth day of the week through the, through the second day of the week. We're talking about the first day of the week through the seventh day of the week. The week. Now, Shavuot is the wedding anniversary of Israel and the marriage to Yahuwah. And this is something that's very important. Uh, that's the second assembly that we have to have. The third commanded assembly is to celebrate the Feast of Ingathering, which is called Sukkot, or Tents, or Tabernacles. At the end of the year, Zechariah 14 says all the nations are going to keep this feast. Um, Otherwise, they'll receive no rain. You might remember that. And it says, when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, this is still quote, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Yahuwah. So women are not, or they're exempt, but they can come. So we have this burden on us, that we that are men, and we have to be 20 years of old, uh, old or, or older. So those, these are commanded times that we're to assemble. Acts 20 is a place where a lot of people go and they say, oh no, they did this on the first day of the week and they did it every week. It doesn't say this, but we're going we're gonna to look at that real quick. Acts 20. It's a place called Troas. Uh, Luke is writing this down. And Luke says, we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember I called that matzah? After the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's when we sailed. Uh, what happens 50 days after the Sabbath and the week, and during the week of Shavuot? Well, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later, we uh, joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So time is passing. Weeks are going by. But it's, uh, you know, it says uh, on the first day of the week in your translation, if you look at your translation, it probably says on the first day of the week. But it doesn't say that in the Greek. It says on the first of the Sabbaths. This is an account to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it says there, it doesn't say that the time has passed up here. If you look back, it says where we stayed seven days. The Feast of Unleavened Bread passed. The next week, when the, when the, uh, when the Sabbath occurred, this is the real Sabbath, not Sunday. On the first of the Sabbaths, in the count to the seventh Sabbath, that's what he's talking about. See, there's the second Sabbath, and the third Sabbath, and the fourth Sabbath, and the fifth Sabbath, and the sixth, and the seventh Sabbath, and the morrow after the seventh Sabbath will be Shabbat But you see, he's referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Matzah. And then on the first of the Sabbaths, in the count to, Matzah, to Shabbat the first Sabbath in the count of Shavuot is what he's talking about. Is we count seven complete weeks to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath to get to Shavuot, which they call Pentecost. Anyway, it doesn't say on the first day of the week in the Greek. It says on the first of the Sabbaths. It says the word Sabbaths. Then it says we came together to break bread. This is a fellowship meal. This is not communion. This is a, get, they get together. You know, Paul spoke to the people. Now, this is actually happening after the Sabbath, not during the day. It happened after sunset because everybody's in their homes and they're keeping the Sabbath. They're resting, they're staying in their place. And then they get together on the first day of the week, or you know, on the first of the Sabbath, at the end of the Sabbath. And we came together to break bread, and Paul, or Shaul, spoke to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. So from sunset until midnight, Shaul is talking because he's going to go on his trip and he may never ever come back. And there were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. 
That's interesting. So anyway, I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't get together on Sabbath. I'm just saying you should, if you can. Uh, the only thing is, how much fuel does your spaceship have? Uh, or is that even a, a viable question to ask? You know, there are people that are out there saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to buy and sell, so that's all, all that's important. But I've got to assemble together because the commandment is to assemble together. Do not forsake for the assembling of yourselves together. But Shaul is not saying that, that, this, that he's saying making a new commandment. Shaul can't make new commandments. But I showed you the commandments when you were to assemble, and that's three times in a year. So it isn't every week, is it? You're supposed to be there teaching your children. If you're running off someplace else, what are your children doing? You're supposed to drag them to, with you and have someone else teach your children? I don't know. I don't think that's what it's saying. But all I'm saying is this is not going to be popular with a whole lot of institutional Christianity, a whole lot of institutional messianic groups. The teachers want you to come every single week. You know, all you have to do is just stay home and study your own scriptures. You know, I can teach you, you know. You diligently seek him. Um, anyway, Proverbs 28.9 is something to look at, too. Uh, this is a, a, a nice little refresher or a reminder that really, it, one, of the, one of the first things that grabbed my attention when I was still a Christian, and I didn't know that I didn't have a covenant with you, was this particular scripture. He who turns his ear away from listening to the Torah even his prayer is an abomination. So if you turn your ear away from Yahuwah's instructions, his covenant, your prayer is an abomination to him. An abomination is one of the high, is the highest Hebrew word for uh, being despicable in his sight. So you don't want to you don't want to be uh, outside his covenant. Now listen listen to this. This is interesting too. Um, These are texts that uh, I'm going to have to remember what I intended to show you. This is uh, somewhat out of order, actually. Yeah, this is uh, where I was discussing the Assyrians uh, last week uh, in 722. BCE when they took uh, northern Israel away um, because they weren't keeping his covenant. You know, that's the reason that they were taken away. And all of, and I was mentioning too that you all are of that descendant, those descended tribes yourselves because they're all over the earth. And uh, we're now seeing a return to the covenant, which is uh, what this is all about. I didn't mean to bring up a controversy about this, but does anybody want to discuss this some more about uh, the Sabbath distance? Is there a Sabbath distance or is there not? Does, who, would, who would say that there is not? Is there one? Because I'm not trying to make people feel uh, responsible to uh, change their way of thinking unless it's according to Torah, but uh, does anybody feel like there? this is something that is, uh, is it really a personal matter? Like Yahushua said, you know, if, if your neighbor's donkey falls into a, a ditch, are you yeah. not going to, you know? You would. Yeah. So you would you would do something that you would help them. If something happens, or, I mean, there are, it's a matter of the heart. That's right. the Torah now. Anyway, right. it's an issue. It's a heart issue, and we have to be, yeah. you know, but it, it'll be according to Torah. But I think that, you know, if something happens along that nature, you're going you're gonna to do something to help someone if it requires you to you know, come out of your house, you know, yes. or whatever. If somebody called me and said, you know, oh, your, your uh, relative or somebody's ill and you, you have to come and do something, I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see what I'm saying? Those things have happened to Those are things that you're going to do. So I, I, I think when it comes to just a matter of deciding to, do, to go, that's where the line is drawn. If you just make a choice to go out and do something, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. then you'll defile the Sabbath. If you do it on your own, uh, you just simply right. uh, make something up and invent it. You're not really focusing on resting exactly. uh, or diligently teaching your children. But those things would happen to our family. Uh, there was emotional outbursts uh, at, at, within the city. They were 
you know, miles and miles and miles away. We had to go help someone uh, mm -hmm. that was having an emotional fit. And uh, then there's those times when uh, you wake up on the Sabbath and you've got this uh, incredible toothache, you know, and you've got to have help. And you've got to go to the store, possibly, and even buy something. But when you read Revelation uh, and you see the beast, uh, the text, I, we're not studying that specifically today, but if you look at the uh, text and you see that there's uh, a beast system and you see that the people are somehow in their minds they're, they're thinking, I, have, I can't buy and sell because the beast won't let me buy and sell because I have not received the beast's mark. That's not the beast that's keeping you from buying and selling, actually. It's actually the Torah that's keeping you from buying and selling. You know, and uh, the mark of the beast would be you being able to buy and sell, you know. So there's one day out of every week when we do not buy and sell. And that would be uh, the seventh day of the week, the same way that the, the Christians have seen the Jews keeping, you know. I mean, they actually, the Christians were so afraid that their people were going to see what the, Jew, the Jewish people were doing that they built walls up around their communities and they called the inside the ghetto, you know, the place where the Jews, and they didn't want them to see how they were living. In, 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 because see, they'd see the Sabbath, they would see them eating according to Torah. And so if they kept those walls up, they didn't associate with one another, uh, then there would be, in fact, the Jewish people didn't want to have anything to do with these other people anyway, because they were outside the covenant. They were the nations, the Gentiles. It didn't matter that they believed in a Jewish Messiah or not. These Jewish people were looking at them and going, wow, these people eat blood, they eat pigs, they profane the Sabbath day. I mean, are they way out there? And they're trying to make me believe in the Messiah, you know, that they are teaching, you know. They don't want to be part of this Messiah. They, they had nothing to do with this. And it was, they were calling by a Greek name, you know. You can imagine from the point of view of the Jewish people what this was like, because they were taught the Torah from around the table. They were little little olive trees that were growing up around their parents' children, and uh, I mean, their parents' table. And when the Torah was taught in the home, then that was according to Yahuwah's will. And when some other person comes along and says, hey, you've got to eat ham and believe in the Messiah and uh, profane the Sabbath, we get together at the steeple. These Jewish people knew what those steeples were. They were bell towers and phallic symbols that the Romans had used and the Assyrians had used. High places, you know, uh, indoor altars. That was scary to a Jewish person. To, for a Jewish person to go into a Christian church, a Catholic church, and see idols everywhere with statues and candles in front of them. Can you imagine what that looked like? You know, there's a statue of Mary, and there's uh, this apostle or something. And, you know, these people, uh, they couldn't possibly absorb, I mean, Christians probably thought they were crazy or something, or maybe they were being rebellious. I don't know. They, well, you see, we've got a, a cultural uh, paradigm shift happening right here. This is where this is happening. It's happening around the covenant. You know, the, the paradigm shift is for 17 centuries, maybe, Catholicism has been reigning supreme on this earth. And, and then some hundreds of years ago, uh, 400 years ago or so, the uh, Martin Luther hammers 96 theses on, up on the door in Wittenberg and says, I've got some issues. There's a little problem here. I'm reading scripture, and this stuff that I'm mentioning here doesn't really line up what we're doing. You know, you know holy water and uh, indulgences and all sorts of things that are completely sacraments. They're outside the, the, the scriptures. They're not even there. So then the doctrines of the church, um, which they felt like were actually not only equal to scripture, but really above scripture because it trumped scripture. You know, it trumped the word of Yahuwah because it changed it. And it said, well, this, is, this can be ignored now. And we're the church, and we make the decisions. You know, according to a few little sound bites that they took out of Yahushua's mouth and made them pop up and mean something, you know. You know, when he was talking, when Yahushua talked to Kepha or Peter, 
and said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my assembly, church. Uh, they took that, and they, that's a sound bite, you know. And that's the way a lot of our thoughts and beliefs are. They're sound bites, you know. They're not, they're not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together out of, uh, you know, Hebrews. Yes, I wanted to know in that first verse what it meant about staying away from things that had been strangled. Well, uh, the thing that was strangled is dead, and it was killed improperly. But you see the uh, way that uh, the proper slaughtering of an animal is that you're planning on eating is that you're to slice it, its throat, you know, and its jugular veins are, you know, ripped open. And then the animal's hung up, and all the blood is drained out, and it's covered over with the earth. That's what he wants you to do away with the blood. And, and that way the, the actual animal doesn't have blood in it as it's dying. You can see if you strangle the animal with a cord or something, then all the blood is in the animal and all the toxins during its death, uh, you know, when the blood is not getting the oxygen and it's, yeah. Actually, even, uh, even hunting would qualify as unclean. Yeah. It, what happens is that the animal has to be subdued and have its throat sliced so that its heart will pump all the blood that's in it out of its body. That's a very good point. Right. The heart Maybe is more still so hunting. than just hanging. So if, right. if you were to shoot a deer and you know, put it through the lung and heart and it dropped the deer dead, well that deer wouldn't necessarily be clean to eat because all the blood would remain in its flesh. It wouldn't have pumped out. Yeah. That's very good. Uh, in fact, I've never heard it put better than that. The heart is still pumping, and the wound that you've caused is so severe that the blood is literally being emptied out by a pumping action. And uh, that's the best I've ever heard. Because in my mind, up to this point, I've always thought that gravity had something to do with it. And it does to an extent, but the pumping action really is really thorough. Well, so. are animals that are kosher to eat, is that how they're killed by yes. their throats being yes. cut? If you, if you buy kosher meat, yes. that's how they're killed, so mm -hmm. it's totally clean. What about other meat in the groceries? Well, I, I, I'd like to hear some, what do you I, mean? I've, I've done some research about that, and I... I've Speak up a little, because they have to hear you. I, I, I've done research, I've talked to different people who have actually been in that process, and they said, have heard that that they kill the animals the same way. They do. Uh, the, it's the blessing of the rabbi. That's the only difference between kosher and non-kosher meat at this point. Really? They, From my understanding, I know people that work in butcher shops. And, um, and don't they even do it in the same in the same place in the same general area? Right, right. So if you, you buy it, if you go like to the Kroger and McMahon Plaza where they have kosher meat or even some of these, it's not really. It's not really killed properly. I mean, uh, from what I understand, it is not killed properly. That it, it just has the blessing of a rabbi. Well, the blessing is more than a blessing. It's actually and examination. That's right. Sure examination helps clean. Well, another thing too that makes an animal clean or unclean has to do not only with what it is, but also what it has been eating. Mm -hmm. Its diet. And right. a lot of these new uh, diets they put these, these right. animals on That's are true. actually eat. They're they're vegetarian animals that are given. Um, flesh. All this flesh yeah. that is ground up. Blood, dry blood. Dry blood, blood uh, uh, other animals. Animalized even animalized even animalized. unclean animals. <laughs> sure. And certainly the hormones and enzymes that they've added to their diet and the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the best thing that you can probably do is just make sure that when you're cooking it, uh, that you're not seeing puddles of blood and removing it from the meat. So that you're not eating the blood, you know. Yeah, but that's a good question. Well, you, know, you, you can actually cook it yourself. You can buy the kosher salt yeah. and, and actually rub the meat, and the blood drains. It, it drains the blood. It works pretty well. I, I think uh, the like the, the specific kosher process. You're supposed to let the meat soak for a half an hour in cold water, then take it out and cover it with salt for I believe 20 minutes is the, is the time they give there. And then rinse the salt off, and that means it would be a, a good idea to buy meat that you know is hormone free and antibiotic free. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. And then kosher it yourself. That's about as close as you can probably. That's about as close. Yeah. 
because the hormones actually go they go straight into the bodies of our uh, uh, you know our families, our little children. Sometimes these uh, I, I have a case in point where uh, a Gentile friend of mine who's not in the covenant that's what makes you a Gentile is uh, actually uh, his daughter when she was nine years old started to menstruate because of all the chicken she was eating. She was getting all these growth hormones, and so this was translating into uh, her own body and causing her to develop faster. And so, and in fact, uh, the doctor said that this wasn't the only case he'd seen. He'd seen a number of them uh, because they thought this was a concern, and it is. Well, is there any other issues about uh, any of those things that the Gentiles... See, the Gentiles are... Uh, actually, the nations are idol worshippers. That's what a Gentile is. And the uh, fact that we're not is because it makes us not Gentiles. If you read Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, or through 13, it says that we were far off because we were not partakers of the covenants. Now that we are, we've been brought near, and we are fellow citizens of Israel. We're not Gentiles, as long as we're in the covenant. Because the people that are not in the covenant are all going to die horribly. That's why we're trying to make the covenant known, you know. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions or thoughts or ideas? But the Acts 15 does address this uh, very nicely. Actually, the topic of Acts 15, if you start reading from verse 1 in Acts 15, you're going to find something very interesting. It says that the Gentile men that were coming into this believer's assembly were not being... Uh, accepted widely by the other Israelites because they were uncircumcised. And so they were saying that you've got to get yourself circumcised. And so they brought this issue to the elders, uh, the assembly of apostles and, uh, in, at Jerusalem. And so uh, that, that's what the whole bulk of Acts 15 is really about is, what are we supposed to do if these people are uh, entering into the covenant? Uh, should they get circumcised or not? And at the end of the thing, it's uh, saying that we trouble them no more than these four things. And to learn the uh, Torah in the synagogues every Sabbath. So, anyway, today we've gone over the fact that uh, we're assuming that, first of all, Yahuwah exists. And that uh, if Yahuwah exists, that he, and he has given us a covenant, that there's a Sabbath involved. And that, and that in fact, the Sabbath is a test. And then we discussed a little bit it got into a little bit more meat and whether or not there's a Sabbath distance or not. If there's a Sabbath distance, maybe we should pay attention to that. If it's written down in Acts chapter 1 as being a Sabbath distance, then maybe we ought to think about that. I think we should probably wrap it up now. We want to thank you all for you know, listening to this debate. We can continue after this and uh, see if there's any more questions. So thank you very much. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. The sun is setting and I'm looking forward to tonight. A preparation is in order for I set apart to you life. It's our delight. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. May this day be yours and mine, I bow down at your throne. Six days shall work be done, and the seventh is Shabbat for solemn rest. For our meeting, I've been needing this most high. My yard, my love My heart wails for Israel A lost heritage, it ails me to know That we're unconcerned with our redemption But your law, it overcomes Our covenant with you must be fulfilled That we may inherit all that we lost once We set our feet from your ways, your knowledge world is covered up our eyes and we refuse to unveil ourselves We are comfortable sitting in our refuge 
twilight to twilight, I am on my way back home. Twilight to twilight, I am on my way back.